back a year ago. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Beer Bound Podcast. Today, we're joined by Professor Joshua Burning. Joshua is an associate professor at Colorado State University in the Department of Agricultural and Resource Economics. Along with his focus towards agriculture, Joshua has written extensively on beer and craft beer in the United States. He's written academic pieces that include Learning by Brewing, Home Brewing, Legalization, and the Brewing and the brewing industry, global craft beer renaissance, the effect of Sunday alcohol sales bans on teen drinking in Georgia, the U.S. brewing industry from farm to pint, and can the craft beer industry tap into collective reputation? We're excited to speak to Joshua and learn more about his academic focus and expertise. So Joshua, welcome to the Beer Bound Podcast. How are you doing? Good. Thanks for having me. Thank you pleasure is ours. So I started off with a little, little introductions, probably insufficient to the profundity of your life. So maybe can you delve a little bit further into who you are and your, and your academic expertise? So I'm a, a associate professor at Colorado State. Um, I've been here now since 2018. Uh, before that, I was at the University of Georgia for five years. And before that, uh, University of Connecticut. So I've kind of made, made my way around the U.S. now. Um, I have a part, part 50% research appointment and 50% teaching. And so with that research appointment, I kind of have two general areas I focus on, one being food marketing, consumer health and demand, and food insecurity. That really focuses on consumers and households. The other side of it is focusing more on industry, and that's dealing largely with the beer industry. And then that's been for about the past six or seven years now, I've really focused in on craft beer and beer industry in the U.S. in particular. Um, I also have a teaching component, which I try to incorporate aspects of beer into a lot of the lessons that I teach. Um, I find that my, a lot of my students really relate to it a lot, a lot better, or at least feel like they can relate to it a lot better. I uh, give some pretty good examples of how industry works and how ag agricultural uh, industries can uh, add some value to the market. So that's kind of my, my background in terms of what I do. Gosh, did you have any interest in beer before your academic career commenced? Is that uh, an interest in yours that goes back a ways, or did you sort of stumble into it once you started your path into academia? Yeah, you know, I, I never gave it a thought in terms of an academic pursuit. You know, obviously, I, I, I drank beer growing up, and I, I've been fascinated, especially over the last 30 years, how the industry has grown quite a bit in the U.S., um, but I never really thought about it until... Um, when I was in the University of Connecticut, a colleague of mine reached out and asked if I was interested in working on some research with him on the beer industry. And you know, we're watching the industry grow and develop and just seeing a lot of really interesting things that they're, they're doing at the craft level and thought it would be just a fun area to do some research in. Not a lot of economists have been doing research in that area yet. Um, there are some, some really good researchers doing some stuff, but it's still kind of a wide open field. So it seemed like a good opportunity for, for us to tap into something that would be a lot of fun to do. Can you tell us about what beer means, just a macro sense of what beer means to the American economy, maybe American culture? I know you mentioned, obviously, craft beer, a subject that Garrett and I are particularly interested in, but mm -hmm. just with a casting a huge net in terms of the United States, what does beer mean to your economy? It's really an interesting question, just because, you know, ever since the, the first colonies started here in the U.S., we've had beer emerge, you know, in the People came over from Europe, they started breweries. That was one of the first things that they did, uh, establishing communities. And as they started to travel west across the country, they built breweries along the way and brought with them a lot of the culture and identity from, from Europe with them. Um, at the same time, there are parts of the US that have sort of a love-hate relationship with alcohol. Um, some of the more blue law states, states that have a little bit more of the Bible Belt feel to them, uh, don't have as much of the same passion for beer as other parts of the country do. So you see sort of a patchwork across the US, depending on the location that you're in. Obviously, it's a huge part of the economy. Um, and in some states do better than others. Being in Colorado now, it's, it's a gigantic part of our economy here. Um, and particularly in Fort Collins, Colorado, I don't know if you've been, but you know we have 23, I think it was the last count, uh, brewers, local brewers in town here. Um, so it's, it's pretty sizable. Um, and you, you're seeing more of that across communities all across the US now in terms of the establishment of these, these craft beer communities where you have more, more establishments popping up, more beer tours, more beer culture, more 
more, uh, you know, participants in the whole supply chain, including micro maltsters or, you know, more regionalized hops is coming back. Uh, it used to be the hops was grown all across the U.S. Then it became focused on, on just on the, the Pacific Northwest. Now you're starting to see it emerge again in places like Michigan and Wisconsin, even further east than that. So it's really a dynamic industry with a whole lot of moving parts to it that are really, uh, really uh, blossoming in a lot of ways lately. Would you say that that is particularly focused on the domestic market of the United States? Because I know alcohol laws in terms of shipping and going international, does beer stay put when it's made in the U.S.? Does it stay there? Is that part of your more of a local economic factor in terms of craft beer? Obviously, that is a smaller slice of the pie in terms of right. the, the entire pizza that is the beer market. So do, do you view beer as really as something that is created in America? It stays in America and it sort of cycles through maybe at a state level or a municipal level or a national level, but doesn't exceed your U.S. borders? Or is it something much bigger than that? Well, there's, there's sort of two parts of that. There's the big macro brewers who are making 6 million barrels more and more a year. You know, the, the Budweiser's, the Miller Coors, um, the, the real big players. And, you know, of course, Budweiser is owned by AB InBev, an international company. And so they distribute all over the world. And so you have that big presence of the macro beers across a lot of states. We have one here just on the road, a Budweiser plant that produces just a ton of beer every year. On the other side, we have the smaller end of the market, which is the craft brewers, who tend to focus more on regional distribution. They try to, to win their own backyard is sort of an expression I've heard a lot of brewers say when we meet with them, is they're really trying to win the customers in their local environment. They're, they're winning in a lot of other ways that they can't compete with Budweiser on. They're competing in terms of environment, in terms of the tap room, in terms of the culture in general. In terms of being a part of the community, even so, we have a very different footprint, a very different presence. And so, you know, for example, we have a lot of great brewers here in Fort Collins that distribute in Denver area, in northern Colorado, maybe in Wyoming, maybe in Kansas a little bit, but not too much further than that. It gets costly to distribute too far for them. So they really try to focus on what they can do locally. You wrote a piece, Josh, on home brewing in the United States and its mm -hmm. legalization and the effects that that had on on in terms of local economies is that um can you touch on that a little bit when home brewing became legal in the united states i i know a, a key year was 1978 i believe right. with mr jimmy carter ironically the sober president yes. uh, overturning uh federal legislation that prevented home brewing but was that a was that a big sweep across the entire country? Did it happen kind of piece by piece? Is it still illegal in some parts of the United States to homebrew? Right, well, it, so prior to that, some states had already started to do some homebrewing. And sort of the stories that you get is that some people in Colorado were actually starting to do um, clinics on teaching how people how to homebrew before it was legal. And the, the story goes that, that there was actually uh, some evidence or some thought that the, the feds had come in and observed the classes to see what they were doing sort of you know, incognito in their white shirts and black glasses to see what was going on and realized it wasn't that much of a scare. So they had been doing home brewing at a small scale and it wasn't really affecting the economy, wasn't really hurting anyone, so they let it go. But, but there are still penalties for doing it. And in some cases, the penalties were a little bit severe uh, from the perspective of a household might not want to incur a penalty for, for brewing at home. And so gradually after 1978, you saw more states legalize it. But it was only a, just a, a, you know, about a dozen or so that legalized it in the first batch in 1978. And you started slowly started to trickle in where more states started to allow home brewing at home. But it wasn't until 2013 that the last two states actually legalized home brewing, and that was Mississippi and Alabama. And that goes along with what I said before, sort of the, the culture of the Bible Belt, you know, sort of love-hate relationship with beer versus other parts of the country that were more receptive to saying beer is a great part of our industry. We accept this. We want households to be able to brew at home as well at the same time. So we kind of looked at how the changes in those laws had an impact on uh, brewing culture and therefore the brewing industry throughout the country. Interesting. Do you, do you draw any parallels maybe to what happened in the 20th century to what's happening now with, with marijuana in the United States? <laughs> that's, a, that's an interesting question. That's that's a little bit, a little bit of a more complex question in some ways, but I, I do, I do hear what you're saying in terms of the parallels. Um, but they've, they've largely left that up to the state still quite a bit, uh, much like beer, which is, which is a similar parallel. Um, I, I would say that the, the relationship with, with marijuana, you know, cannabis in particular, 
is a little bit has a little bit more taboo to it associated with it than than beer did itself. And even during prohibition, people were still drinking alcohol, and people who still, you know, don't want necessarily want to have alcohol around their state still tend to often have you know imbibe to some extent. Um, so I, I think I think marijuana is a little bit more of a, a touchy subject though still across the U.S. I think that's changing, um, but yeah, th there's some subtle differences there in terms of the culture. I'd say. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I don't think the idea of beer necessarily compared to marijuana in certain more conservative states right. really is a comparable feature. But I was just more focused on sort of the trends of like gradually letting the door open. And it seems yeah. like more states are kind of coming along and it does become legal in some states. But it's kind of different because I know there are some states, if I'm not mistaken, that legalize marijuana and then illegalize it again, I think so. There's a lot of complexity there too with, yeah. with the laws and, and what's legal and what's not. It's illegal at a federal level, illegal at the state level. So what does that mean exactly if you're a producer, if you're a grower, if you're a distributor? Even the banking regulations with it are just really um, a real pain for a lot of the growers I know, but that's a little bit beyond my, my knowledge base right there. So, Is it legal in Colorado, marijuana? It is. Yeah. It is, yeah. I thought so. Yeah. Yeah. The cool state. All right. Um, <laughs> you speak also about uh, you. You use a, a phrase that Garrett and I like as well, like a craft beer renaissance. I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you mean by a renaissance? What do you What do you mean when you use that term in some of your writings? Oh, and you, you know, we thought about using that word. We looked up what renaissance exactly means, right? And and there's sort of two parts to it, which is really a, a revival of art and style and culture. And so we thought that was that was really apropos of what was going on in the industry, right? You see a lot more styles in terms of the different types of craft beer being produced. You see a lot of different culture being involved with with uh, beer production, going from the original American light lager, you know, the Budweisers and the Miller Coors. You start to see just a lot more culture and style and innovation going on with beer in general by the producers. At the same time, Renaissance also refers to a revival of interest as well, and you're starting to see that with consumers where they were really getting interested in trying these new things. Whereas before it was, you know, they, they drank their six pack, their traditional six pack that they got every Sunday. We eventually said, well, you know what? Let's try some other stuff. Let's see what these Imperial IPAs are like, or what these sours are like, or what these barrel aged, you know, stouts are like. There was just this whole market of interest that was, that was really blossoming. And so now it's become more of a, an event to go out and say, what do you have on your tap that I've never tried before, or that I've never seen before? How do you, what can you impress me with next, you know? And I've, I've talked to a few brewers who say that, um, you know, beer drinkers are promiscuous in the sense that they really like to have a lot of variety and go out and try all the kinds of new things. And so a lot of ways, that's just a, a renaissance of what the consumers are willing to do at the, on their end as well. well that, is that kind of like more the point where, I guess, you know, previous to the big macro beer, I guess, you know, there were all these smaller craft breweries where I guess it would be more catering to the consumer. So is that kind of what you mean where now it's like, you know, power is kind of back in the hands of the consumer in a sense? To some extent, I think there's been, a, I think there's been a partnership there that we didn't have before, you know, early 1900s there were around 2000 breweries in the US, but then we saw this big decline as we headed into a couple of world wars into prohibition into, you know, the, the dust bowl. Um, and then you saw a lot of, um, uh, uh, mergers and a lot of big big breweries sort of merge all over the country and the, the quality and the style of the beer really started to, to become much more uniform and so it wasn't until about the 80s that you really started people start started saying we want a little more variety we want something besides what we're traditionally drinking and so I think there was this partnership of there has to be demand present right for for these breweries to take off but at the same time someone has to offer a little more variety someone's got to be willing to take that chance and source a new variety of hops or a new type of malt or something like that so I think together it's been it's been this process where the customer and the producer have been kind of going hand in hand down this path of how do we create this really neat culture. Do you see, Josh, uh, any parallels or connections with craft beer as a symbolism for maybe the entrepreneurial spirit of the United States? I see this sort of as maybe a 21st century phenomenon of taking of of doing away with this culture of having these massive macro companies dominating the market and really kind of this this glowing sense of artisanship and taking a step back and realizing that maybe we should have a little bit more quality in our life instead of just massive forms of quantity. I mean, 12 
Bud Lights are nice in to drink in one night, but maybe we don't need just massive consumption. We can right. take a step back and we can enjoy some more quality in a beer. Do you see that as a bit of a 21st century cent a 21st century phenomenon or am I looking too deeply into nothing? <laughs> no, I think that's, I think that's an interesting point. Um, I think there's been a lot of that all across the supply chain, you know, starting with the, the equipment that's used anymore, you go into any brewery in the U S and you know, particularly craft microbreweries, um, they tend to, tend to have equipment that's been formatted and, and fitted for their shop alone. Uh, and so there's been a lot of innovation in terms of what kind of equipment can be used there and how they're going to fit it into a smaller space in a, in a part of town where they're trying to, you know, make ends meet. Um, and then, you know, in terms of the ingredients, you, saw, you see a lot of innovation in terms of hops development, the quality and the style of hops being developed. And that's that's aside from the brewers themselves. And then you have more maltsters coming along her saying, hey, can we do, you know, a few tons of, of malt every year and then get, create partnerships with brewers that are going to want more unique varieties of, of barley and, and wheat and things like that. So I think you're seeing a lot more creativity all across the supply chain. Then at the same time, in terms of distribution, you also have to have dis distributors that are really going to be more um, forward looking and saying, how are we going to distribute this product where we're not just dropping off kegs and kegs of Budweiser? To, to the bars or to the retailers? How are we gonna to distribute to places that are actually gonna to want to market and sell our product? And so there's a lot more of developing those relationships with the bars, with the restaurants and, and having those kind of conversations of how do I sell this kind of Imperial IPA to someone or how do I sell a milk stout to customers that haven't had it before? So I'd say, yeah, across the board, there's just a lot more room for creativity and sort of people to, to develop relationships, which makes the whole industry kind of fun in a lot of ways. Josh, I usually save this question to the end, but I'm too curious and I have a feeling I'm going to forget. So do you, do you think we're in a, a craft beer bubble, maybe in the United States specifically? Have we reached a capacity where we can't really grow anymore or do you see ample room for growth? That's a really good question. Um, I wish I had better numbers for you on it. I will say this, when I first got into the craft beer or the, the U.S. brewing industry, um, there are a couple of economists out of Washington State at the time who were who wrote a book on, on the beer, brewing industry, and they sort of predicted in this, this was 2006, that the, that the craft beer industry was going to be sort of a fad, that it was going to fall to the wayside. And, you know, then we're at probably 2,000, 3,000 breweries in the U.S., and then it was 3,000, and then it was 4,000, and they kept breaking through that ceiling. And every couple of years, I'd hear, we're in a bubble, we're going to reach a bubble, and it's going to burst, it's going to burst, and we haven't quite seen it yet. And now I think I checked the other day, we're at like 8,000, 9,000 breweries, something like along those numbers in the U.S. Um, let me see real quick. I have it on my screen. 9,000 number of breweries in the U.S. right now, according to the Brewers Association. Um, but it's starting, to, it's starting to taper off a little bit at the top now. You're starting to see that, that curve bend a little bit, an inflection point. So, you know, I was asking my class that the other day. What are, what are you thinking is actually going to happen here going forward? Are we at an inflection point where we're going to have a bubble burst? And if you look at who's really been growing the last few years, it's been the, the large macro brewers are growing again, the regional brewers, which are, you know, 15,000 to 6 million barrels, so larger size as well. Um, and then the, the tap rooms are growing. So it's kind of this mix of really big guys or really smaller ones that are maybe a little bit more unique and, and, and integrated with their community. The micro brewers, those kind of small range people who don't distribute very well, they're actually seeing a decline in, in the numbers right now. So it's kind of, I think you're seeing a transformation in the industry. Um, rather than necessarily a bubble bursting, I think there's some economies of scale to be had right now. You know, we're in this, this great big inflation right now. There's a lot of input, high input costs. And so the big guys, they're, they're just more equipped to handle it. But if you're a local guy who serves your local community and can offer some value locally, I think you can still make it in this market right now. But you can ask me that again in a couple of years and we'll see where, where we're at at that point. I'm going to write that down and yeah, right, follow right. up with you in 2026, maybe. Sounds How good. does that sound? Right, right. Yeah. Well, Josh, I, this is a big hypothetical. I've, I've wondered mm -hmm. about this sometimes, and maybe it's too big of a question to ask anybody because it would be such a disturbing force. But say in 2022 or next year in 2023, the federal government banded together and said, Prohibition 2.0, no more alcohol. Could you give us a sense on what that would mean in terms of the agricultural industry of the United States? Would that be a huge factor, like a huge disruption to the entire chain of, of different forms of agriculture? Is it really just a drop in the bucket in terms of what U.S. 
big agro has has in yeah. its in what it's doing or could you give us a sense on what you think would happen maybe this is too grand of a no, question that's a, that's a great question i wish i i wish i'd done my research on the numbers on, on that uh, before hearing that question i will say you know the hops growers they're, they're largely locally isolated in yakima valley washington uh, some in idaho some in oregon there's some spread across the country but the majority of the market is in that area um but they they work together a lot of times they're, they're in cooperatives a lot of times and so i think i think they would weather the storm pretty well by exporting by by saying all right you're, we're gonna start selling to europe more we're gonna start selling to asia more um of course the price point that they get would would be discounted because they'd be flooding the market with you know everything we're not selling in the u.s is suddenly going overseas so someone survives someone would be hurting but we'd see a lot of the, the growers that are trying to start these new hops vineyards and our hop, hop yards in uh, in Michigan, they would probably fail. The ones that are on the East Coast that are trying to do this would probably fail. Um, the, the maltsters, the ones that are growing, excuse me, they're growing barley and, and, and wheat and things like that, specifically for brewing, I think would have, um, you know, we'd see some loss there for sure, because there's only so much of that we're going to export. Canada does a, its fair share of barley as well. so. Um, I, but I, I don't know. I don't know exactly that threshold of where it would really kill the market, right? Where a lot of those guys would shut down. It would take them a while to transition to other things. Luckily, if you're growing barley, you can transition to other stuff as well. But it takes you a couple of years, and it's not exactly an inexpensive proposition to suddenly switch from 500 acres of, of barley from malting to, you know, something else. Um, so we would we would certainly feel the impact. There's there's no way we wouldn't feel the impact of it. Not to mention the retail side, right? I mean, there's so much that, that these breweries do in terms of um, community dollars, community engagement and involvement, uh, bars and restaurants. I mean, part of the reason to go out a lot of times is to not only have that pizza, but a couple of beers as well. So I think it would have a major impact that would, that would, that would really feel a shockwaves across the entire economy. Not to mention all the support industries, the aluminum, the kegs, the distribution. Just think of all the industries that support uh, beer so I, I like i said i'd have to do some little calculations on to figure out how much of an impact that would be but it would be it would be sizable for sure so like the craft brewers of washington become the al capones at that point in time just getting beer out as they could <laughs> yeah i know it would be it would definitely be interesting to see what would happen you know with, especially in our political landscape how people would react to such heavy-handed government intervention but i don't think uh I don't think our the government was is quite ready to move to that that far of a level yet. I I, I pray. <laughs> yeah, let's all let's all pray. Yeah, I think yeah. Major League Baseball would go out of business, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you, Josh, you referred to beer as value added agriculture. Mm -hmm. Can you explain a little bit as to what that term means? So value add is wherever you add some sort of value through a manufacturing process, a marketing process, or some service to increase the value of the primary good. And so basically, the reason we said that, it was, it was a little bit tongue in cheek to say it, but you know, the general idea is you take, you take basically a grain, and then you take some hops, and you take some water, and you take some yeast, and basically you have beer, right? And there's some craftsmanship that goes on top of that, and that's where the value is. You know, by themselves, those, those goods don't cost that much, and no one really does a lot with you know, with malted barley other than candy makers or some flavor makers. No one really does anything with hops, but you put that all together in the right way, in the right formation, and, and you, you, know, you get the right yeast, which is also a huge market in terms of, uh, in terms of it bringing value to the market. And then brewers really, really are, you know, part of this great craft where they're doing something that not everyone can do. You know, a lot of people like to brew and we used to brew it in my house, you know, but we realized it's just, it's really just a lot easier just to go out to a better brewery and find something for you know a pretty good price point. But the value add process is where you're you're adding some value on top on top of the primary agricultural product. And that's that's what makes beer kind of a neat industry because it's really closely related to the farm and what's going on with the farmers and the growers. Then it takes that and and you you're seeing these farm to farm to pint type you know uh, brew pubs and places like that now that are really taking that message to heart of. We're taking this agricultural product and doing something really neat with it. So that's in a nutshell what it is. Right. So is that the same concept as like any created process of say like a pizza or a hamburger? Is that the same sort of is that the same concept or is that am I not understanding? If it's similar. They're a little bit further down the supply chain though, right? So if I'm a if I'm a McDonald's, right, I don't really have my hands on the beef a lot of times. Uh, the potatoes are probably the closest thing that they actually have some sort of direct sourcing with. 
Um, but you know, the, the cheese, the buns, all the other stuff that they use. And, and then you go to any local, you know, McDonald's not to pick on them, but they're not, not really adding the, the value in the same way. They, they purchase that value from other people. Whereas brewers are really much more closely related, you know, particularly through hops. They want to know where their hops are coming from, uh, the quality of them, um, and and the same with uh, malt and wheat. They want to know the quality of the product that they're getting because the different components that they use, the, the protein levels, the different acid levels, all the, the aspects, the, the chemistry that's beyond my pay grade for making beer, they they take all that and they make a, a finished product that that's you know consistent and palatable for the consumer. So that takes a lot. That takes a lot of skill on their part. Whereas, you know, me throwing together a burger is not that much different than Wendy's or McDonald's throwing together a burger. I'm buying the goods that have already been processed, already been manufactured, already been packaged to a certain extent. Does that make sense, the difference between those two? Yeah, I think okay. so. I, yeah, absolutely. So, okay. So I, I want to jump back a little bit. This is a little bit more of a legal question. You're in a very pro craft beer state mm -hmm. and your, your next you're not too far away from some others as well. You're in a pretty great spot if you're a beer fanatic. So that's, that's great. Is it, are you aware of Josh, the sort of the legality behind brewing? You mentioned that the last two States um, legalized home brewing in I think 2013, I think you said mm -hmm. it now in terms of actually owning and operating a craft brewery and the, the creation of, of artisanal alcohol, whether that be beer or whiskey or what have you, is that kind of like, there must be different rules state by state. I, mm -hmm. I'm, I suspect these aren't federal, federally regulated. So how does that affect the growth of beer in some areas? Are there some states that really, are, that you're familiar with, are they, they kind of shy away from beer altogether? Or are there ones that are, are far more interested in the culture? Can you give us a little bit of a sense kind of nationwide of how, how popular or unpopular beer and craft beer is across the US? Sure, so beer is regulated at a federal and state level. From the federal level, we have the three-tier distribution system where brewers brew and they, they sell their product to distributors who then sell it to retailers. And there's a chain of custody there where they actually hand off the product to each other. They have to keep pretty pretty strict records of where the product goes and who's handling it at, at what point and sort of the, the markups on all that stuff. And so that's at the federal level. At the same time, states have, have allowed variation in those rules. For example, some, some states allow smaller scale brewers to sell directly to customers at, at a smaller scale or sell directly to, to um, other bars and restaurants at a smaller scale or distribute themselves. But there's a lot of different variation in, in between those two, those two models in terms of who can who can sell, who can distribute, who can produce uh, beer and alcohol. Um, now the differences are really kind of interesting in the sense of when I was in Georgia, um, at the time, uh, breweries couldn't sell beer to directly to customers on site, and so what they did instead was they sold tours, and you'd come to the tour and they could give away five free half pours. So it was sort of, sort of a way of skirting around the issue, but they were kind of limited to that, you know, 30 ounces of beer that they could offer as part of the tour package. Um, but that really limited what the, the brewers were going to do. But they changed the laws when I was there. I don't know if you know Creature Comforts Beer, but they lobbied really hard to help get those laws changed in, in the state of Georgia. They worked with a lot of uh, other brewer associations to get those laws changed. And as soon as they did that, you saw all these other small craft brewers pop up because it came marketable and, and, and feasible for them then to have on-site sales which had a big different, made a big difference in terms of the industry. And so in Athens, Georgia, where, where University of Georgia is located, you went from just a couple small brewers there on site to now, you know, half dozen, I believe, on site and more growing around the state. So those laws have a really big impact on what the brewers can do. Now, I, I'm not a legal expert on that, but, you know, a lot of people talk about the, the stacks, the volumes of, of stuff that goes into, into the legal aspect of the brewing industry. And so, you know, with a variation between state to state, you really have to have your eye on the ball in terms of how you navigate that area. And so, you know, if, you, if you're looking for another career, someone who can deal in the legal areas of the brewing industry um, would be quite valuable, I think, to a lot of brewers. And then you see, you see some states, of course, that are, you know, in terms of the amount of alcohol content that they allow in the beer to be sold it varies. Interestingly enough, Colorado, uh, up until three years ago, didn't allow... Uh, anything full strength alcohol to be sold in grocery stores here. And they finally changed that law in 2009 where they allowed everything over 
uh, to be sold in grocery stores. And that has, that's had a big impact on what you see now on the retail sh shelves, right? Um, and other states that have done that as well, you see this big impact in terms of what the brewers can do and what the, where, where they decide to distribute their product, going from liquor stores to now grocery stores and convenience stores and things like that. So in a nutshell, yeah, laws, laws really play a big role. There's a, there's a lot of research being done by economists on those, how do those different laws impact distribution and, and the outcome of the industry. Um, and it's just, it's kind of a ripe area of, of work to be done in. Josh, can you give us your sense on the three tier distribution system? Is that, is that a necessary force in the US? Does it prevent some, does it prevent the market growing in any sense? What's your take on, can you explain it a little bit further and what it means for beer, beer sales and, and the beer market all across the US? Yeah, you know, when I when I first got into this, I thought, you know, from an economist perspective, free market kind of economist thinking about it, that, you know, it's kind of a ridiculous system It's a, it's a, a relic of the uh, prohibition era, a post prohibition era where they legalized alcohol again. And they said, but you have to have this distribution system in there in place where distributors, you know, get to hold the product before they sell it to retailers. And I thought, wow, this is ridiculous. It's got to be so prohibitive for, for brewers. But you know, this last couple of years working here uh, with a lot of people in, in the state, going out and talking to some distributors and talking to breweries, we realize that there's actually a lot of value that distributors can bring to the market in the sense of one, that they hold and store a product that is expensive and, and heavy, you know, eight, eight, eight pounds a gallon, basically. It's, it's not perishable, but it, it's easy to get destroyed. And so they offer value in terms of space to put it because brewers don't want to store product. They want to make the product and get it off their, off their premises. So the distributors offer that service in terms of storing it, in terms of finding where to, to, to sell it, and they build those relationships as well. So you're seeing more and more where brewers work with their distributors to have those conversations to say, how are we going to market this product? How are we going to get people to, to buy what we're, we're, we're selling here? And the distributors come back to the brewer sometimes and say, hey, look, this really isn't working here. We need to think about some other sort of plan here. So I, I, I find, at least at the craft scale, there's really more of a, a strong relationship between the brewers and the distributors and what they can and can't do. And some states have more favorable laws that help those relationships as well, where the, the, the brewers sometimes distribute themselves, but they also work with the distributor on the side and they try to make sure that they play nice between those markets. So they're not poaching from each other and that they can have a, a beneficial relationship where they're all, they're all working for the common cause of, of selling good beer. It's interesting. I always thought, well, I know we spoke, we spoke last time um, with an individual, he's an author, Nate Chapman, he, he spoke a little bit about that three-tier distribution system. I, and I kind of thought afterwards a little bit, you know, how that might affect the craft market. And, and I like the point you brought up that, you know, distribution centers or, or, or distributors in general may have a, a benefit. And to that point, you know, obviously space mm -hmm. is a big one. They know maybe the retail markets that they're familiar with, which is good. Um, but then I was kind of thinking, and mind you, I, I'm, I'm by no means an expert in, in the U.S. system, or maybe you can opine on that, is, you know, if, if a craft brewer wanted to, how easy is it to become producer, distributor, and retail option, like basically vertically integrate the whole chain? Like, I don't know, I'm not sure if you can talk to that point or if it's been done, but it, I'm assuming that might be a possibility. Yeah, there, there is, uh, you know, certainly in, in this area, we have uh, breweries that sell on site. So they are a retailer from that perspective for on-site sales. They distribute themselves and of course they're the brewer. Now there's, there's rules and there's, there's permits that you have to get at each, each level, each stage. And that, that's beyond my knowledge base, but you know, it's really a decision that they have to make what's gonna be beneficial for them. And so you know, we've talked to some brewers in some cases, it just makes more sense to get a distributor to do the work for them. I'd rather get the, the smaller markups on a product but sell more volume. Right, so the trade-off is how much volume am I, going to, am I going to be able to do and at what price markup? So selling on site, maybe that's, that's a really good volume for you. But at the same time, you have, to, you have to have the staff to do it. You have to train the staff to do it. You have to have the right location. So maybe it's better from your perspective to say, well, I would rather go with distribution. And some breweries don't sell on site at all for that reason. So I think it's a case by case where you look at, one, how much it's going to cost you, two, what the, the sort of net all around benefits are going to be from a margin and volume perspective. And then what kind of relationships do you feel like you're gonna have with the distributors? Some laws also make it such that it's really hard to get out of contracts with distributors. And that varies state by state. Or once you're in a relationship, you can only get out of it if they let you out of the relationship. 
And so that can also create some apprehension before you might want to get into a relationship or you're not sure how it's going to work out. But again, there's so much variety between, you know, Illinois, Colorado, California, Texas, all the different places. They just have different rules in place on how they operate. So that's kind of in a nutshell, my take on it. Yeah, no, I think that makes sense. I guess maybe just a function of resource and overhead and, and maybe how yeah. big you are, how small you are. Um, yeah, no, that, that's interesting. If you're a small team and you, you know you don't have the salesman, you want to you know, get the distribution to help out. Or if you're a big team and you think you can handle on your own, I guess it's case by case. And we definitely sure. see a, a wide variety of craft breweries that are large enough to do it and small enough to do it. We've had a number of brewers uh, on our podcast and, and, you know, a big thing here in Canada, specifically Ontario, is whether or not craft breweries will work with our local, um, I guess, distributor in a sense, which is the LCBO, the Liquor Control Board of Ontario. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, some are all for it. Like, yeah, I can do the volume. I can get in the LCBO and I can get a couple SKUs and, it, and it's good business. And some are just like, you know, never. It's not going to happen. Don't right. want to do it. We're going to sell to our, our, you know, our clientele in the local area and, you know, put our markups on it so yeah i guess it just depends yeah you know part of it too as well you know what we found with colorado when they changed the laws in terms of selling in, in the grocery stores is grocery stores are can be really demanding in terms of what they're asking for in terms of fronting the product in terms of having someone on site you know every other day or every day or you know however many times a week and you know small breweries look at that and say we don't have the capacity to do that to have someone show up at you know each grocery store and make sure that everything's fronted the right way and everything's stocked the right way and so that distributor takes that burden off their shoulders in terms of handling that that side of things for them as well. So, you know, if you're if you're trying to get to that retail market, it really can be valuable for them. I'm not sure, Josh, how how um, how knowledgeable you are on the actual ins and outs of distributors and how that market works. Are you aware of? how free of a market it is in terms of say if Garrett and I wanted to open become distributors in the state of New York is that easy to get into is that very heavily regulated can you give us a sense on how it works I I really don't have a great sense to tell you on how that works like I said it's it's state by state and so um, I know it can be challenging a lot of times for, for distributors to get into the market and it really depends on on who the players are in the market. If you do have big brewers in the market, they can really make it hard for others to come in and compete. Um, you know, if you have the, the Budweiser's, the Miller Coors types, the type of folks out there, they can make it really difficult for other people to come in and compete just in terms of scale, in terms of contracts and things like that. So, but I, but I, don't, I don't have a good sense of, of offering you guys any advice in terms of starting your own distributor in, in the state, so. All right, we'll have to do some other research. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, give it a shot. We'll go down south and get yeah, it. Yeah, I think it would be difficult <laughs> for us in general, not having adequate work permits or anything. But um, Josh, you touch on on a subject of collective reputation and its mm-hmm. connection to craft brewers in the United States. Can you tell us a little bit about that and what that means and its ties to? to craft beer in the U.S.? Sure. When we, when we wrote that, that write-up of the paper, we are kind of looking at the market and wondering how can craft brewers compete going forward? What can they do in a market that was getting a little saturated and getting a little competitive and you know, facing some issues, certainly in terms of the economy as well? And so you know, this idea of collective reputation is that, there's, that consumers recognize some sort of distinct characteristics of a sign of higher quality. So you can think about, you know, uh, Napa Valley or, you know, Walla Walla onions or, uh, you know, products from certain areas, you know, uh, Parmesan or Reggiano from some parts of Italy, right? There, there are certain characteristics that are recognized. And with that, with that signal of quality, there's actually standards that go along with it as well. And so we were sort of brainstorming on the idea of, well, could, could the craft beer also tap into that by creating certain standards or rules or regulations that would give them sort of a competitive edge? So you see people that that sort of turn to, for example, the California IPAs, and you know they go to a, they go to a brewery and then there's or they go to a, a restaurant, for example, and there's maybe 20 things on tap and they say I have no idea what I want right now. I don't recognize any of the brands or labels, or you know I've already had a few of those. I don't want to try anymore. What what can I look for? Well, they can look for something that says California IPA and they say oh yeah IPAs from California are generally pretty good. Now the problem is that there's no standard that maintains the quality of California IPAs. And if I was sort of a, a, a free rider in terms of a brewery, I might come along and say, well, 
California IPAs are doing great. So I'm going to call my, my American light lager, which is really cheap to make a California IPA. I mean, that's a little bit of an extreme example, but right. They're going to downplay sort of the quality of what they're doing and try to free long ride along with that, that name, that collective reputation. So you really have to have standards in place to make that happen. So we were just curious whether or not that could actually work, um, particularly as a lot of places are growing sort of unique varieties of hops that are going to be, you know, sort of branded to a certain state or to a certain region. Could they could they capitalize on that aspect of growing hops and, and putting that in your beer to, to assure a certain level of quality? You see it a little, you know, to some extent with the Trappist beers that are made. You know, they have to be they follow certain regulations with the with the Trappist monks and, and how what they allow to be produced. Um, the Reinheitsgebot laws in Germany you know, to a certain extent has certain quality standards that make German beers sort of renowned throughout the world, right? You don't, you don't ever really kind of turn your nose down at the idea of having a German beer. It's sort of synonymous with higher quality. So um, that's, that's kind of in a nutshell what we were thinking of that, that paper. So there's no, yeah, I've never really thought about that. There's no <laughs> regulator at all in terms of, of, in terms of dictating what you can and cannot label your beer as, like, you could, it would be stupid because you would lose a lot of your reputation, but you could label your light lager as an IPA, technically? You know, I, I don't, I'm curious about that. That's, that's a really neat question to look into. I, I don't know. I, I do know that they have the style guides, right? And, and they have about what three different style guides out there that kind of give sort of the, the levels of IBUs and malts and the characteristics and sort of what's expected of a certain style. But I don't, I don't know of anyone that goes to a brewery and says, well, let me see what you put in here in terms of the quality of it. Now, I think, I think there is the aspect of the industry, the cons consumers in the industry really regulate it pretty hard. So if, you know, if a brewery put out something that was, was complete garbage or was, was claiming to be something that wasn't, I think consumers would really crash down hard on it. Uh, but at the same time, you do see some subpar beers out there with, with names on the side of them, you know, in terms of a style of beer that you say, this is really not the best, you know, hazy I've had or the best whatever I've had. And, and you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that they're doing it intentionally, but they might be cutting corners on ingredients or quality or, or preparation of what they're doing. Good point. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting. It does. It's not a very, I guess the, the, the mass, the masses dictate what the style is and you lose a lot of your credibility in making a large error in terms of mm. misbranding your beer so probably not a good idea maybe it can self-regulate itself in terms if it's a in terms of a free market perspective maybe to some extent but you know at the same time you know there's a lot of diversity in taste as well and so you know you see certain beer styles that come out by the mass produced mass produced beer makers and Sometimes they're really not on point for what a craft beer drinker would want, and yet they still sell, sell a ton of it, right? Because people say, well, the price point's good. I can find it at the local grocery store. Um, it's good enough for me. And so that kind of drives down the quality level. Whereas if you think about things that really have this collective reputation, they're, they're not looking to sell a whole lot of stuff. They're trying to maintain that reputation at a high level so that when people think of, you know, prosciutto or, you know, De Parma or, or, or uh, Parmesan Reggiano, they're, they're really thinking of this high quality, right? Or the AOC regions in France, they're really trying to maintain this high quality standard. So they're not trying to shirk on what they're putting in in terms of the effort with, with it. So US is a little bit different in that area. We, 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 I, think, I think sometimes, you know, when people see an opportunity to maybe cut some corners, they might take it in terms of, in the, in the, you know, to the, to the gods of capitalism, so to speak, right? In terms of how to make a, make a little extra money off things. So. Maybe that's pessimistic, but it's, it's getting dark here. So, I guess there's no one really knocking down the you know the door of a brewery saying, I guess to your to your example, you know, American light lager that's viewed as an IPA. To your point, the consumers will probably knock down the door and say, "I'm never buying from you again. This is ridiculous." Right. Um, and I, the only things I know, like you're saying, you know, the style guides and there's the as a BJCP, like the Beer Judge Certification Program, that mm -hmm. you know will outline what styles, you know, quote unquote, should be. Mm -hmm. uh, based on tasting guidelines and, and how things were traditionally and then you know there's competitions and, and whatnot and how and you know brewers went to that for the prestigiousness and obviously reputation and maybe that in itself it's its own sort of self-governing body in a sense um but i guess there's nothing really similar to like um like you were saying with parmesan and whatnot you know where there will be someone i'm assuming will come in and crack down 
on a product that is inferior in quality or maybe even not necessarily quality but inferior in like the ingredients list and actually just well I, I think I remember reading an article not long ago and there was a and maybe to the same point here is that there was a um, a distiller in Nova Scotia here in Canada who was brewing like a scotch style whiskey but I can't remember the association's name in Scotland came down with an iron fist and was like no you cannot <laughs> you can't even have scotch in the name that is not scotch and I right. think they went to sue them and were successful and they've done that a few times so maybe that's you know we don't have anything to that extent I suppose well there's champagne and sparkling wine right so, that's a big one yeah yeah so there, there's definitely people that, that are very sensitive about those issues for sure and with good reason i'd say but yeah josh what's your favorite beer style <laughs> uh you know it, it varies by season you know or at this time of year i'm really kind of tired of hazy ipas and juicies I've, I've had so many all summer long and so as we get a little colder i really love the barrel age stuff um you know sort of as my my friend likes to tell me the sort of boozy sort of sweet malty stuff this time of year just it sits a lot better and there are some really nice barrel houses in uh in fort collins i do some nice barrel aged stuff so i really enjoy those so do you know cozy. why yeah sorry Gary, go ahead no, i'm just saying warm and cozy we're coming up on <laughs> stout season anyway right right yeah josh why why is colorado such a beer loving state is it just the the history of the the mountains what is it C can you can you tell us why <laughs> Why is Colorado so obsessed with beer? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think part of it is, um, one, the history of Coors being in the region. I think, you know, the, the, the historic historic relevance there of it being here. But at the same time, you also have the, the abundance of really great water um, historically, which makes a difference. I mean, the water is really clean and fresh and, and cool here. And then, then you throw in on top of that, the culture. You know, a lot of the a lot of the the places where you know, as I said at the beginning, the the people migrated across the country and started these sort of enclaves or different different beer styles and, and beer environments and created their own breweries. And I think a lot of people that move out west are sort of this independent lifestyle of I, I work hard and I I gonna have a nice cold beer afterwards as well. So it just it goes along with what what people are like here in Colorado, you know, and in Idaho and Wyoming and Montana and all these regions on the Rocky Mountains are really just sort of this rugged lifestyle of being outdoors and and you know playing hard and and working hard and playing hard kind of thing. So I think it just goes along with that. Can you delve into any of your research that you're focused in now? Are you working on any particular academic pieces that are associated with beer that connect? Uh, craft beer at all is there anything in the works that we can look out for in the future or, or not 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 so much we have one paper right now that a group of us in colorado state worked on um for one of our grad students that was looking at the idea of what how did the changes in the beer distribution laws affect breweries of different size and scale here in colorado so when they allowed allowed distribution of full strength beer through the grocery stores who did that benefit the most and so we did a pretty extensive survey of a lot of the brewers in Colorado to say, well, what were you, where were you distributing before and where are you going to distribute post change in the laws? And so what we're, we're curious is to see, one, does that have any impact on the composition of what we see in the market? And two, does that hurt any industries? So as you might imagine, a lot of the, the liquor stores are actually a little bit worried about this because before they had a little bit of a monopoly on selling full strength beer. And what we saw was you know, a lot of the regional beer breweries and the macro breweries, we're going to start selling more through grocery stores. Um, whereas the micro guys were really saying, you know, it's just not worth our time to go into grocery stores. We're going to stay with the liquor store environment. At the same time, we, you know, our grad student did a really nice study, uh, Nathan Pilardi, who does, who does a lot of beer research as well. He's now at the University of Florida. He did a neat study looking at foot traffic and what happened to foot traffic in these different areas once the law changed. And you saw that fewer people were going to liquor stores to some extent. So it did, it might hurt their traffic a little bit in terms of more people going to grocery stores now to get the alcohol. You know, if, you, if you're able to go get beer and toilet paper and dinner and, and other stuff at the same time, it might make it a better trip than just going to the liquor store to get beer anymore. So that's one of the papers that we're really trying to, to, to get out the door right now that, uh, well, it's, that's, that's part of the academic publishing process, which would, is a totally different uh, story to, to talk about, so. No, that'd be cool to see the results on that. I feel like we've seen the same sort of thing here, uh, mm -hmm. at least in Ontario anyways, like, you know, beer has entered the grocery stores for a couple of years now. 
Um, but maybe it might come down, a catalyst might be a variety because you, there, we do see a number of actually, you know, smaller craft breweries get into, get into the grocery store, but, you know, you're not going to get the same ver- variation of variety as you would as, you know, going to the LCBO. So right. um, maybe that it might even drill down to like preferences at that point. It'd be interesting to find out. Yeah, I know for sure. Do you see it? Maybe Josh, I know you're connected with doing a lot of uh, your research. I think you're probably pretty well connected to a lot of craft brewer, craft brewers and just with your research. Are you, are you seeing that more? I'm interested in the fact of getting more craft beer into say into supermarkets, into grocery stores, into other outlets. Is that, is that something you said it, you made it clear that a lot of craft brewers are saying it's just not worth our time. It's just, mm-hmm. it's a, it's a, ahead of our capacity, mm-hmm. but is there a little bit of a forced play in that way of, well, it, like Garrett mentioned, our main kind of, of essentially a little bit of a monopoly that we have in, in Ontario, not quite a monopoly. But there's a few mm-hmm. uh, outlets, but what's like a monopoly a, a triopoly three maybe um but oligopoly. Uh, <laughs> yeah oligopoly. oligopoly that's right that is the word so a lot of craft brewers will put their product into the liquor control board of ontario the main sort of uh the main supplier and vendor of of alcohol not really as a way to uh to add to their their profit but instead it's kind of a marketing play just to have those mm. beers on the shelf in order to market their product to the typical consumer just to just to get their name out there and to say we're here we're our products on the shelf and we're one of the main players do you see that as a bit of a play that crappers are forced to make or really there is just that sense of it's not worth our time we get way more um, we get such a larger margin if you actually come to the brewery and purchase right. on site or can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think there's, I think there's sort of a split, you know, in terms of production scale. And as you get into those larger regional producers that, that produce enough barrels, they have the, not only the capacity, but the, the desire to get a little more of their skews out in front of the com- consumer. Uh, it's worth their time that it become a little more recognizable. You know, if you're a small producer here in, in, in town, though, um, you know, you're going to get a, a single skew out on the shelf, maybe, and people might not buy it, people might not recognize it. It's really hard to do, uh, make it worth your time in terms of creating a sustainable market. You're going to do better by selling uh, in your tap room or by distributing to, to restaurants. And, you know, the, the craft beer industry is kind of interesting that way, too, is that if you build up a good reputation that way, there is actually, you know, a certain amount of demand that's built out of scarcity. You know, there's a, there's a lot of brewers that brew single batches a year or, or small limited editions and say, you know, we're going to we're going to brew this much and we're going to sell it. And that's all there's going to be. What does that do to the price of it through the roof? Right. And then you see these black markets for beer all across the country where people are saying, you know, I got me a, a six pack of the Alchemist and I'll send it to you for, you know, 30 bucks or whatever it is. Right. So it's there's a lot of those types of markets that emerge. And I think the brewers view that as maybe being more advantageous. But again, it's it comes down to that economic question, right? That, that the business management question, I guess I should say, of what's the price point I can get and how much volume am I, am I going to be able to do with it? And going through grocery stores just isn't going to have either necessarily for uh, some of those smaller scale brewers. But I, I don't know exactly where that threshold is, right? Mm-hmm. It's kind of there, there's there's a number there someplace where you say it's just not worth my time. Right. Have you seen the inflation crisis that's going on in, all over the world and in yeah. the United States? Of course, has that affected? craft beer i mean i'm sure it has but to, yeah. to what degree would you say yeah it's you know it's it's affecting input costs in terms of you know cans in terms of uh, input costs um, for for kegs getting those things back um the the economy has done better the last few years but the nice thing about beer is it tends to be sort of counter cyclical so even when the economy goes down people tend to drink beer still it, it does pretty well um but, you know, some of the input costs have gone up. You know, one of the bigger concerns that's coming up now is really the water issues. And it's not so much right now per se, but forward looking saying, how are we going to supply enough water to make beer in the future when we still have to make agriculture? We still have to grow crops. We still have to, you know, feed our, our supply residential neighborhoods. And so I, I think you're starting to see sort of a perfect storm a lot of areas in terms of 
one energy and then input costs on top of that and then water right how is that all going to play out going forward and so i think some some brewers are trying to be a little more forward looking in terms of how to be a little more sustainable yeah i think that's really a good point i think about that often and when if and when the massive environmental movements all across the globe will maybe kind of go after the alcohol market just in terms of kind of how frivolous and wasteful it is and maybe we should devote our agriculture and our water supplies and to cut down our co2 in this particular area because we don't really need wine we don't really need whiskey we don't really need vodka we don't need beer like i wonder if that i haven't seen that pop up at all in terms of it's more of maybe we should cut down on co2 in other ways maybe we should stop eating meat Mm -hmm. maybe we should stop uh, driving gas-powered cars, but haven't really attacked alcohol yet. You know, there was a there was a brewer I just saw an article on. I didn't I don't remember the brewer in Colorado that was looking at using recycled water basically for the brewery. And I and I think you know that was sort of the the original intention of, of brewing beer in a lot of ways is that water was dangerous to drink in in Europe, right? In a lot of small towns, and and it was really dangerous. And when they came to the U.S., they thought, well, why would I drink water out of uh, water out of a creek that's dangerous, right? And so that process of boiling it and manufacturing something from it really took off. So I think now, I think you're going to start to see more breweries that are going to be more creative. Um, that's, that is the nice thing about that industry is I think the incentives will help push them in the right direction in terms of how do we be more sustainable? How do we be more uh, conservative with our water usage, our energy usage? I don't know if you guys do this in Canada, but one of the things that they have an issue with is getting rid of spent grain. They do all this brewing and so they say well, what do i do with this grain well i could dump it but it's going to cost me huge fees in terms of dumping it, and it's really wasteful to do and so instead they find farmers that they contract with they'll come in and take it off their hands and feed it to their cattle right animal feed yeah 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 so it's, it's kind of a, a neat innovation right that that's really mutually beneficial for everyone so hopefully we'll see more of that going forward uh, maybe i'm being a little too rosy colored here but uh but hopefully we'll see mm-hmm. well josh we've taken up uh, about an hour of your time. Maybe I'll end with a final question. Do you see any, do you have any predictions at all in terms of maybe the next, the next 10 years in the craft beer market? Anything that'll happen that you think maybe folks aren't particularly focused on? The floor is yours. Wow. <laughs> that's, a, that's a big question right there. I know. Um, I didn't give you much time to think either. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, no, you know, I, there's there's so many moving parts in terms of the industry. I think, like I said, I think we're going to see, I think we're going to see more of a division here again of of the big brewers really gaining more market share back, but then the small guys really owning the local environment. I think there's just there you know in terms of the perfect storm again in terms of the costs are just going to make it so much easier for the big guys to produce a lot of beer and ship it and, and dive into that market and you know that 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 fear that people used to have of getting a craft beer from a mass producer, right? That's sort of fading a little bit. People don't worry about that label as much anymore. Um, but at the same time, you see all these, these local guys that are really digging into their communities. They're, they're involved, they do community events, they're part of part of the environment. So I think you're gonna see sort of this, this continued split where you have these, these local guys doing really well for the community and you have the big guys who are servicing sort of the, the bigger market. So that's sort of my, maybe not bold prediction, but but not a bad one and a fair okay. place to stop, I think. <laughs> Josh Burning, uh, Associate Professor at Colorado State University in the Department of Agricultural and Resource Economics. Josh, thank you very much for the time and looking forward to connecting again soon. Yeah, it's been fun. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Thanks, Josh. Thank Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all our interviews and beer-related content. Remember... Craft beer is here.